Australia is the greatest nation on earth. And at the referendum last year, Australians told the elites they want to keep it that way. Is 2024 the year mainstream Australians continue to secure our way of life, or will the elites strike back? In Season 3 of Australia's Future, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott will share his unique insight on the future of the Australian way of life. Hello Tony and g'day to all of our listeners. Great to be back for another episode of Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. Uh, today, lots to discuss as always. We'll kick off with uh, Tony's intervention into the debate regarding four-year fixed terms. Uh, we'll discuss the growing threat of China and we'll also be discussing the proposed uh, changes to uh, religious freedom and the capacity of schools uh, to choose teachers and staff and students that are consistent with their religious ethos. Tony, great to be back for another chat. Dan, it's wonderful to be here and uh, thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure as always. Uh, So last time we talked about fixed terms of four years uh, at the federal level. Uh, many in the political class back the idea. You were perhaps a lone voice against it. I'm happy to say that your comments were picked up in The Australian over the weekend, a very timely intervention into the debate. Uh, there was polling released earlier this week in The Australian uh, with News Poll. Uh, a majority support the fixed term, but only a bare majority of, of just a fraction over only 51% in fact. Now that's significant because in order to actually implement four-year terms, you'd need a referendum. And Mm -hmm. as we know, it's a majority of people in a majority of states having just gone through that last year. So it almost certainly would not pass. Uh, So Tony, just briefly your reflections on that debate and and this polling. Well, Dan, I was a, a little reluctant to be on a different side of the issue uh, to my friends, John Howard and Peter Dutton, But uh, as I said last time I was here, a good government should not be scared of an election. And with a bad government, an election can't come soon enough. And I really think that what we need in this country is not fewer elections. What we need in this country is more determined governments. What we need in this country are more people in our public life with character, courage, and conviction. That's what we need. Um, the problem is not too much democracy. Uh, the problem is uh, poor government. Uh, particularly, uh, I think the problem has been that uh, too many coalition governments have been uh, too ready to agree with the other side. Now, thank God Peter Dutton seems to be very much of a different temper, uh, but we've seen certainly at the state level a lot of uh, liberal national oppositions and governments mm. that have been almost indistinguishable from the alternative. And I think what people want is a contest. They want contests. They want clear contests between um, two opposing political teams that have uh, different programs to to take our country forward uh, that are backed by people who really believe in those programs. And that's really what we need on the centre-right. And as I said... uh, that's what I think is developing with Peter Dutton, but but that's what we need. Now, look at the states. The states all have four-year terms. Mm. Does anyone think that government is better at the state level because they've got four-year terms? I mean, the idea is ridiculous. You've only got to ask the question to, uh, <laughs> to know the answer. The idea that because they've got four-year terms, uh, you've got uh, much more um, intellectually strong, administratively uh, coherent government it just doesn't stand up. Yeah, and just in terms of breaking down those results, so when it came to Labor voters, well, almost two-thirds of Labor voters support it, uh-huh. uh, only 51% of coalition uh, and only 33% of those who are voting for One Nation or, or independence. Uh-huh. What was really interesting to me is older voters were much more likely to support it than younger voters, uh-huh. and I think that gets to probably an element of cynicism uh-huh. among some younger people in the political class, and maybe they can see what it is, which is just a power grab and an excuse to not have to face the people. Well, that's right. If you think back to the best federal governments we've had, um, the Howard government, obviously, uh, I think the Hawke government was a pretty good government. It was certainly our best ever Labor government. Um, Those governments uh, were not in any way hurt by having to face the people. Mm. In fact, uh, I suspect one of the spurs uh, for the introduction of tax reform before the 1998 election and then legislated subsequently was because 
the government knew an election was coming up and it wanted to have something worthwhile to take to the people, given that it had been a pretty messy first term for the Howard government. So, yeah. so look, um, there's got to be a point to government. Um, and uh, having to account to the people relatively regularly is a good thing, not a bad thing. Mm, indeed, no. Well said, and I think uh, once again you've shown yourself to be a, a, a tribune of the of the people, with <laughs> the politicians lining up on one side. But um, good on you for speaking out on on behalf of what what the people want. Okay, let's move on now to uh, the issue of China. Mm -hmm. uh, I bring this up in the context of recent reports that uh, the United Kingdom is looking to declare China a threat uh, to national security after cyber attacks on politicians and their election or electoral commission. Uh, according to the reports, Britain is set to declare China a threat after two malicious cyber campaigns targeting Westminster uh, parliamentarians. Now, this is quite a significant development uh, for there to be a public or an impending public declaration that China itself is a national security threat. Um, Tony, you've been very involved, particularly in your post-parliamentary career, in national security issues, traveling to India and the UK and the US. Um, can you give us an assessment of um, why this is happening now and what this means for the future of the global order and, and global security? There's no doubt, Dan, that uh, Chinese uh, state-backed actors are routinely launching cyber attacks on institutions, organisations and entities in countries such as ours. There was... Uh, a major outage of the Parliament House uh, um, IT system a couple of years ago, which was almost certainly uh, the responsibility of uh, um, a cyber attack emanating from China. Mm -hmm. um, up till now, we have been extremely coy about calling China out. In particular, the current government has been extremely coy, at least over the last 12 months, uh, when it comes to uh, saying anything that might be taken amiss by China uh, or the Beijing government, I should say. Um, good on Penny Wong for belatedly joining uh, the UK, the US and even New Zealand in talking about the danger of uh, cyber attacks emanating from China. But to get to the bigger issue, if you like, Dan, mm -hmm. um, look, we are now well and truly into... Cold War II. Um, we are now well and truly into an era of uh, strategic competition between the two great powers of our day, uh, the United States, democratic United States on the one hand, and uh, totalitarian communist China on the other hand. As I constantly say, we have to distinguish between the Chinese government and the Chinese people. The Chinese people, like people everywhere, uh, want to do the right thing by their families, by their neighbours, by their workmates. They just want to get ahead. But the Chinese government uh, under the CCP is bent on becoming the dominant world power as soon as possible, but definitely by 2050. We just have to accept that this is a reality. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a new Cold War. Uh, in some respects, China is a more formidable uh, strategic competitor than the old Soviet Union ever was. Mm. Um, Russia was only ever a third-rate economy, even though it had a first-rate military. Uh, China is a, a first-rate economy uh, with uh, rapidly a rapidly developing military to match. So we are in the early stages of what uh, is a very serious contest indeed. And at every level, we need to be ready for it. We need to be ready for it militarily, economically, and above all, culturally. Um, we do need to build up our armed forces, and frankly, uh, no Western, none of the main Western countries are doing this quickly enough. Mm -hmm. um, we do need to uh, refrain from the gratuitous acts of economic self-harm mm -hmm. that we are routinely engaged in right now, uh, most particularly we need to recover the self-belief that was at the core of our victory in the first Cold War. People like Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher uh, and the blessed uh, John Paul II, these were people who believed in the marrow of their bones, in the strength 
and the virtue, the moral quality of Western civilization. And too many people today who should know better uh, are constantly uh, ambivalent or even hostile uh, to the values, the practices, the Judeo-Christian ethic on which the world's greatest countries have long been built. You talk about building up our armed forces and a couple of uh, chats ago you went through some of the challenges in our defence sector and that was uh, very well received by listeners Mm -hmm. uh, because um, I think the information – I mean people have an understanding that something is wrong with our Mm. acquisition and our readiness. Uh, Can you elaborate on when you talk about a build-up of armed forces Mm – what is it that you mean? Are you talking drones, missiles and so forth? What does it actually mean? Well, this operates on on many levels and I should admit, if you like, Dan, that I've never been a soldier myself. Uh, I'm not um, a professional military strategist, um, but obviously I am a former senior political decision maker. Now, it seems to me that um, we need to very swiftly learn the lessons of the Ukraine war, Mm. which is that the nature of the battlefield is evolving very quickly uh, and drones um, uh, and uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, IT are incredibly important. Uh, We don't have any armed drones in our military. We've been talking about it for years and it seems that we're about to uh, keep talking about it for years (laughs) rather than actually make decisions, even though some of the drones that the Ukrainians are very successfully putting into practice have actually been designed and developed here in Australia. But as well as um, swarms of drones and uh, autonomous unmanned vehicles uh, in, in different uh, media, uh, we, also need, we also need platforms. Now, um, our Navy... Has uh, has not had any uh, serious. Well, let's let's go back to the start. Um, all credit to the Albanese government uh, for coming up with a plausible pathway to get the nuclear powered submarines that we desperately need. Um, unfortunately, uh, having got ourselves onto a plausible pathway to realise AUKUS, it's as if. Uh, they thought, well, great, we've done all the important work. Uh, So decisions on the surface fleet, uh, decisions on all sorts of other things were put off. Uh, And notwithstanding the recent announcement that we are going to acquire uh, a significant number of additional light frigates, Mm. in the short term, we're retiring at least one and possibly three uh, of the frigates we've actually got. Uh, We need more ships now. We don't need more ships in 5, 10, 15 years' time because, again, as Ukraine shows, uh, conflict can break out with a quite short lead time. I mean, Putin began his build-up on the borders of Ukraine um, five or six months before uh, the actual attack. Uh, So Ukraine had a relatively short time uh, to... uh, to get themselves into an active state of defence. Now, um, they uh, did it remarkably well, given the disparity in power between those two countries. But we don't know uh, when hostilities could break out across the the Straits of Taiwan. (coughs) We don't know uh, when uh, uh, there could be further problems in the Middle East, Uh, there could be further problems in Eastern Europe, Uh, which is why we have to be um, militarily, economically, culturally and mentally more ready for trouble Mm. than we currently are. I think that's right. And uh, just to round that out, Tony, I think um, there's probably an element of just in terms of the population that they're just not really aware of the potential challenges that are coming. I think for many the idea of war and hot conflict is something in the past. Um, so I think that one of the challenges that political leaders will face is not only in terms of the actual material and the practical components of it, but it's actually communicating to the public the potential urgency uh, behind some of these issues. So what 
what advice would you give or if you were in that position, how would you be communicating to the public on, on these matters? Well, it's a very good question, Dan, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, we desperately, desperately want armed conflict between major nations to be a thing of the past. We desperately want that because um, if there were to be a uh, major conflict, particularly between the superpowers, uh, the consequences could be absolutely cataclysmic. Uh, we can see on our TV screens uh, the result of uh, uh, the Russian attack on Ukraine in terms of absolutely devastated cities. Uh, we see what's happening um, in, uh, in the Middle East right now. Um, war is hell in every sense. But you don't avoid uh, problems by wishing them away. You avoid problems by anticipating them uh, and then taking clear steps to try to ensure they don't come about. And uh, bullies are not deterred by weakness. Bullies are deterred by strength. Um, the best way to ensure uh, that there is no uh, further attacks by the dictatorships on the democracies is to ensure that the current attack uh, by the Russian tyrant on Ukraine is defeated, uh, to ensure that the current uh, war um, uh, against ap apocalyptic Islamism uh, by Israel is won, and to make it crystal clear to the commissars in Beijing that any attack across the Taiwan Straits would not pitch, would not pit uh, 1.4 billion. Chinese against um, 25 million Taiwanese, but at the very least would pit China against a strong partnership of democracies and potentially China versus the rest of the world. We, we just have to make it crystal clear that the price of aggression is too high for any rational person ever to want to pay. And whatever other faults the a Beijing government has, I do think it is at least rational in a way that might not be true of perhaps uh, uh, Hamas mm. or some of the leadership in Iran. Well, let's hope so. Uh, let's turn to an important matter on the domestic mm. front now, which is that of religious freedom, uh, in particular in relation to religious educational institutions. Uh, there's been a recent report from the Australian Law Reform Commission pertaining to the uh, discrimination laws and the exemptions that apply yeah. to uh, religious education institutions. Uh, in essence, the recommendation is to change the Sex Discrimination Act so as to remove the existing exemptions for religious institutions. Now, what this in, in effect will mean, uh, if these were to go ahead, uh, is that schools would lose the ability to recruit and retain staff, uh, students, uh, and teachers in a manner that is consistent with the religious ethos, which in many cases is the reason why parents choose to send their children to those schools. Um, there's a lot of problems with our education system, yeah, but, but one of the shining lights that we have in this country is the choice that parents have to go to a state school or a non-state mm -hmm. school, be it religious or independent. I think over a third of students go to a non-state school, which is quite high. So um, this would actually significantly reduce choice for parents. Um, Tony, you've always been a strong champion and believer in religious freedom mm -hmm. and choice. Uh, can you talk us through your reservations and concerns about this uh, proposal? Uh, thanks, Dan. Look, uh, I think this is uh, quite a pernicious proposal. Uh, it is really a dagger aimed at the heart of religious institutions, particularly religious schools. Uh, you're right. Um, you cannot have religious schools if the people in them, students and staff, are in open defiance of the religious values, you cannot, as it were, give activists a charter mm. uh, to undermine schools dedicated to a traditional Judeo-Christian or indeed uh, Muslim or Buddhist or whatever uh, ethics. So, so this is... Uh, uh, a bit of a fraught moment uh, for religious freedom in this country. Um, there is a report, as you rightly point out, from the Law Reform Commission that would drastically reduce, if not entirely eliminate, the ability of religious schools to operate mm. in accordance with their ethos. 
there's obviously a lot of support inside the Green left for going down this path. And um, if it were to take place, uh, we will either be setting up uh, a major fight between uh, people of faith and um, government mm. broadly, mm -hmm. uh, or we are going to further undermine the Judeo-Christian ethic in our society. So I think this is this is very serious. It all arose out. It's it's all part of I suppose the 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 backwash from the same-sex marriage debate. Um, after same-sex marriage became law, there was considerable concern about the ability of religious schools to keep teaching that sacramental marriage, at least, is between a man and a woman. And there was a demand at that time for uh, some kind of positive freedom of religious, uh, some positive protection of religious freedom. Um, unfortunately, as we know, uh, same-sex marriage wasn't the end of the Green Left's demands. Uh, we've now got uh, all this trans activism and, and uh, the trans activists in particular are very concerned um, to try to ensure uh, that uh, religious schools cannot have a particular position, the traditional position. So, so the effort to protect religious freedom has ended up producing something which is much more likely to erode it yep. uh, than to protect it. Now, my view is that uh, given the composition of the current parliament, uh, given the state of cultural play in contemporary Australia, um, no legislation that's likely to pass is going to be an improvement on what we've got. Um, and the existing exemptions in the anti-discrimination law uh, should not be considered as giving religious schools freedom to discriminate. They should be construed as enabling schools to have religious freedom. Mm. Um, this is not a right to discriminate for religious people. This is a right to practice their faith effectively yep. uh, for religious schools. Yeah, it's a good point. That's the problem with anti-discrimination mm. laws. If you're exempt from the laws... Yeah. You can be, um, as you say, charged with the idea that you want to discriminate, That's which right. is the whole problem with the framing. Yeah. Now, the way that the point, the way that the left frame this, or the anti-religious left frame, frame this, is basically that, uh, well, schools want to kick out students yeah. who are gay, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. but that's not the what case. happens in well, practice. It's, it's not. It's not what happens in practice. That's I mean, right. This idea that um, Christian schools, for argument's sake, are busting a gut. Uh, to dismiss gay teachers and to expel gay students is simply false. Uh, there are lots of gay teachers and gay students uh, in religious schools and invariably a pastoral, in inverted commas, approach is what these schools adopt. As every Christian knows only too well, uh, none of us are perfect. Uh, all of us, in a sense, are sinners and uh, uh, we need to be understanding and compassionate uh, towards sinners, but what we can't have are people who are actively campaigning against the ethos of the school, protected by law to do so. Now, that's why I say that if the proposed changes were to come about, and there is a lot of support for them inside the Green Left, including inside the Albanese government, it'll be an activist charter to disrupt religious schools, mm. particularly Christian Christian schools. Well, they're definitely the target. Mm. Um, one other point I want to make here, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, is a lot of parents who send their kids to a religious school uh, do so not necessarily primarily for the religious mm -hmm. purposes per se, but because they're more confident that there'll be a values-based yep. education, that there'll be some protection against the woke yep. indoctrination, and they yep. hope to have more parental control over what's happening at the school as – the quality, unfortunately, we used to be a country that had very good state mm -hmm. schools. They've unfortunately declined over the years. And what you see is a lot of lower middle income aspirational families who are really striving to get their kids into some of these schools because they think they'll get a better outcome. But this is also going to not just a religious issue, it's also an aspirational issue. And, and indeed an educational issue mm -hmm. because the last thing we want is propaganda masquerading as education. Um, look, I... I, I Absolutely agree with you, Dan. Uh, 
parents want a good education, uh, often they're less interested in, I guess, uh, uh, you know, the, the heavier duty religious aspect, if you like, than they are in um, good values, strong character, uh, general decency, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know whether this is uh, relevant to our audience, but I've just come back from the United States. And amongst other things, uh, I was uh, talking to a lot of people who are involved in uh, what might be described as classical liberal education, uh, education founded on the great books and the Western canon. Uh, these schools are really flourishing uh, in the United States and it'll be interesting to see uh, whether there is a, a comparable movement developing here in Australia. And the interesting thing about these schools is they don't just have an aspiration to teach um, the great books, uh, the best that's been thought and said, the true, the beautiful and the good. They're developing a very detailed uh, curriculum so that in any year, in any subject, at any time, it's crystal clear what the teachers should be teaching and what the kids should be learning. And mm. uh, it's in its own way uh, not dissimilar from the direct and, and explicit instruction that people like Noel Pearson uh, were talking about for remote schools. And having been in schools myself that were complete anarchy, complete anarchy, utter demoralisation everywhere, and then having seen uh, in Cape York a few years back uh, the difference that a really explicit teaching method and curriculum can make uh, to see um, the kids, the joy of achievement in these kids as they grasp that they are actually making progress, uh, to see the enthusiasm of the teachers because uh, this is a class that's obviously under control uh, it's incredibly encouraging. So while it's easy to be a bit despondent, uh, uh, what I saw in the United States last week uh, uh, was both uh, uplifting and encouraging. Well, it's fantastic to hear and hopefully we see more of that here in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, to round out the chat today, Tony, I just wanted to get your uh, assessment of I think what is one of the biggest issues in the community, which is the mass migration mm -hmm program that this government uh, is running. Uh, we've had over half a million people enter last year, by, by far the highest uh, on record. Yep. Um, the long run historical average is around 125,000. Uh -huh. uh, and we've also got this in the context of a per capita recession. Uh, per capita economic growth has gone backwards for four consecutive quarters. The last time that happened was in the early 1980s in the middle of a global economic recession. So as we know, migration makes the pie bigger, mm -hmm. but the share of the pie that everybody's getting is now smaller. Mm -hmm. um, this shows the limitations of the migration-led economic growth strategy of the government, doesn't it? Look, uh, uh, ever higher immigration is uh, the lazy way to generate economic growth. The right way to generate economic growth is through uh, uh, deregulation, it's through lower taxes, it's through better education systems, um, it's through encouraging creativity, uh, but instead, uh, for most of the last uh, couple of decades, we've had uh, immigration-led economic growth. Now, I'm pro-immigrant. I think every Australian has got to be instinctually pro-immigrant because we are an immigrant society. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we've got to constantly ratchet up immigration. And just at the moment, uh, we have got almost out of control legal immigration mm. because so much of these numbers are uh, being stoked by educational institutions that use uh, overseas students as a cash cow. It's at the heart of their business model. Mm. And uh, to be candid lazy businesses that would rather bring in people from overseas than train up Australians or indeed pay Australians a, a decent wage to do jobs that might be a bit unfashionable. And I really think it's important that we do go back to the sorts of figures that we saw in the Howard era, which was roughly, I think, 110, 120,000 a year, at the very least until housing, infrastructure and uh, 
uh, all of the other services that people need uh, can catch up. Uh, I mean, we need uh, to cope with these sorts of levels of immigration at least 200,000 new dwellings a year. We're lucky to get 100,000. Mm. So uh, at the, uh, if nothing else, immigration on this scale uh, is driving the explosion in rents, mm -hmm. the explosion in house prices, which is making it almost impossible for young people to get ahead, which is adding to general social demoralisation. So this is a very important long-term issue uh, and government at every level, but particularly the federal government, has got to get it back under control fast. Mm. Um, one last question just what I ask. So there's the economic issues, uh, but then there's also what we've seen is social fragmentation, I think, over the last year or so. I think a lot of Australians have been looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the importation, in essence, yeah. of that conflict into yeah. Australia and wondering, well, hang on a minute, why are people coming to our nation and bringing their ethnic tension and religious tension here as well? To me, it seems much worse, certainly in, in my lifetime, maybe in the post-World War II era, there was tensions as well. But I think a lot of Australians are, are concerned about um, this sort of tension being brought into into our nation. Um, what are your thoughts on the on the social cohesion challenges that we face? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Look, I suppose uh, uh, ethnic memory uh, leading to uh, social difficulty is not uh, a entirely a recent phenomenon. Mm. Um, if you go back to the conscription debates of the First World War, um, Irish Australians and English Australians tended to be on opposite side of that mm. and a lot of that was uh, the antagonisms generated by the Easter uprising and subsequent events uh, back in Ireland. So I don't want to say that uh, the situation at the moment is, is utterly unique, mm. uh, but I certainly accept the general principle that we don't want to import the world's problems and the best way to avoid importing the world's problems is to ensure that everyone who comes here is expected to join Team Australia and is expected to understand and accept uh, our social values. And while I'm not saying that it was only migrants uh, uh, who have been uh, marching in these uh, uh, ugly protests in favour of the genocide of uh, of um, of, of Jews in Israel, um, nevertheless, uh, there has certainly been uh, some uh, immigrant component and uh, we've seen Islamist preachers uh, saying, look, if you don't like what I'm saying, radical Islamist preachers saying, if you don't like what I'm saying, deport me. Well, I tell you, I'd deport them. Mm. I would deport them. <laughs> uh, and frankly, uh, we should make it crystal clear uh, that people who can't live by our values and who are not Australian citizens uh, are really not that welcome. Mm. Well, I think you're right there, Tony. So I think we'll be touching on this topic over the coming weeks and months. So as always, appreciate you coming in. I know you've been in the United States last week, very busy as always. So always appreciate you uh, taking the time. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. This is a production of the Centre for the Australian Way of Life at the Institute of Public Affairs. To find out more, visit australia.ipa.org.au.